Oh yeah, my name is Ben Sherry. Welcome to my channel. Tonight, brothers and sisters, I have a very, very interesting show for you tonight. Check this out. I have the whole entire uh, Breakfast Club interview with Charlemagne the God and Joe Biden. Well, check this out. Again, I'm gonna try to do a whole complete analysis of, of the of, of the whole entire interview. It's my first time doing this. I'm kind of nervous, but anyway, I'm gonna try to see if I can bust it out. But anyway, sit back, hang tight, and I'll be right back. Peace. brothers and sisters um now before i get started i like to say that i am not here to dog charlemagne um personally i don't i don't know charlemagne but um i think you know he's he's starting to get better you know as far as asking the right questions um and and i like to say that i am not here you know to you know to dump on him so here it is the full interview and if you guys are interested in the whole entire inter interview i left links in the description so you guys can check that out um okay all right so sit back Relax and enjoy the ride. Peace. Um, I, I have a few things I want to talk to you about. This I know day. you have. Yeah. You don't know me. No, I don't. That's why I want to get to know you today. I want to get to know you today. Um, I want to talk to you about mostly black stuff. But, you know, first of all, how are you? How's your family during this quarantine? Whoa, Charlemagne. <sighs> okay, my brother. He came out swinging. I like that. I like that. He used black. First thing, black. Yo, give them that black. Give them that blackness. I love that. He came out swing. Beautiful. Thank God everybody's doing well. How about you and your family? Man, we over here blessed black and highly favored, man. Well, I tell you what, the black community is getting killed, though. That is very, very true. That is very true. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of right-wing media outlets. They, they question you. They question your cognitive health. They don't, they don't, think, <laughs> they don't think everything's working upstairs. What, what do you say to that? Whoa, again, he's not, he's not holding back. Charlemagne is not holding back. Um, he directly started, you know, asking Joe Biden about his mental, um, mental health. Hey, listen, everybody, check this out. Joe is kind of old, you know, I mean, I'm going to be old and, you know, everybody's going to be old at, at, at one point in their life. But hey, this guy's kind of—I don't—I don't know. I mean, for him to be running the country at the at the age that he's in, it's kind of scary. But Charlemagne, good, good, good. I like that. Keep it up. Keep it up. Let's see what's going to happen here. I said I can hardly wait to meet with that guy who is the stable genius. <laughs> There's nothing stable about that guy. 
You know, one, one, one thing I've been critical about is I feel like you've been like MIA during this global pandemic. You know, it's people like Governor Cuomo here in New York who have become political stars simply because we see and hear from them every day. So I'm just, I'm just like, how, I'm, I'm wondering how you're going to energize people and win a campaign from the house. Well, I tell you what, I'm doing, I'm, I'm following the rules, man. <laughs> Number one, I'm keeping the rules. My governor says he doesn't want us out. I haven't been out. I wear my mask. I have a mask. I got Secret Service outside. I walk outside. I have it on. They get tested. And by the way, I'm beating them across the board. All right, check this out. Joe's going to be using man more than once. Like, okay, he's talking to a black man, so he has to use, like, man more than once. Mm -hmm. Over 160 million people have watched me so far on shows like yours. Okay. All the stuff about it hurting me. It's not hurting me. I'm winning in all those states. I'm ahead in all the national polls. And uh, the more he talks, the better off I am. Yeah, we, we know polls, polls can be illusions, though. Like, you know, we, we looked at all the polls in 2016, too, and look what happened. Totally different, man. 2016 is totally different. What you had then is you had somebody who didn't, they didn't know it all. They wanted to just change the system the way it was. He was the biggest change. He had no serious opposition that turned out to materialize. And uh, so it's totally different. Right now, we're in a situation where it's like, you know, that Carney show goes through town once and you find out there's no pee under any one of those three shells that get pushed around. Mm -hmm. Next time it comes back, what do you do? Next time it comes back, you ain't playing. You got to figure it out. Okay. And let me tell you something. My community figured it out a while ago. But here's the deal. What I have to do is I have to continue to talk about the things that matter. And the things that matter are, for example, right now there's a study out of Columbia University and the Disease Control Center up there. They pointed out that if he had listened to me and others and acted just one week earlier to deal with this virus, there'd be 36,000 fewer people dead, dead, mm. dead. And you guys are wondering what are we? What's he doing? Come on, man, get a life, get a life. This guy has been incredibly terrible. And what what we've had is, you know, back in when uh, in January, I said I wrote an article back in I think the twenty seventh of January. Said this pandemic's here. We should act. Every other country that was acted around the time got the notice around the time we did. They have considerably fewer deaths as a percent of the population. I'm the guy that said we ought to take hard records and find out exactly how many people in the black community are getting COVID and are dying from it. And look what's happened. Now everybody's going, oh, surprise, surprise. Look, everybody knows this. We have to come back. We have to fight back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the crisis lays lame. Hey, Joe, I got a solution. Give black people in this country reparations. Bear the institutional racism that's still prevalent in our society. And I believe we have to address it by transforming our economy and this time bringing everybody along. And we haven't, look, he started to undermine the pillars of his economy before. The, look, the blinders, Charlemagne, in my view, have been taken off. Okay. Now people recognize that those essential workers, a disproportionate amount of them are African Americans and they're breaking their necks risking their lives, losing their lives. They're grocery store workers, they're bus drivers, they're delivery people, they're the people who are on the line. They are the, they're, they're he they're the healthcare workers who are in a position where they're taking care of the nurses. I mean, and, and they're making basically the minimum wage. So this time when we come back, we had not only rebuild, move this along, we not only rebuild, but we have to transform this economy. We can create millions of new jobs in transportation, energy structure, we can, there's jobs, a, a job is a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about how you treat it. And that's how we built the, from the working class to the middle class. But this time we have to address the institutional racism. We've seen it more clearly now. In a, in a black majority county, they're six times more likely to die in a pandemic than a white county. They're disproportionately uninsured in the African-American community, disproportionately make up the essential jobs that they, that they can't do at home. They're risking their lives every day. Enough's enough. And this Biden recovery I'm going to put together will bring everybody along. I'm going to build a better, a better future, not back to what we 
once again, be careful. Coded message. Everybody. Now, brothers and sisters, when you start to talk about helping out the black community, all of a sudden it becomes like a everybody situation. Yeah, but a better, back to something better than we have. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, I don't know if you saw a couple weeks ago, um, Sean Combs, you might, you might know him as Diddy. Yeah. He, he said what I believe a lot of black voters, including myself, feel, and that's that Democrats take black voters for granted. You know, um, votes are quid pro quo, right? It's not like I don't want to vote. I just want to know what candidates will do for us in exchange for our votes. The same way young progressive Latinos or the LGBT community. Absolutely. We want the same thing. Do you feel like black people are owed that from the Democratic Party? Absolutely. Paul. What would I say? Remember when I said Biden can't win the primaries? Yes. I kicked everybody's out. I, excuse me. Brothers and sisters, just to let you know, that was a scripted line. It I don't talk like that. I need you to say that. You no, did no. what? I won overwhelmingly. I told you when I got to South Carolina, I won every single county. I won a larger share of the black vote than anybody has, including Barack. Brothers and sisters, he's going to emphasize that. He got the old black vote, not the young. There's a complete difference. I increased the vote in Virginia overwhelmingly by 70%. Look, what people don't know about me is I come from a state that's the eighth largest black population in America, the eighth largest. I get 96% of that vote for the last 40 years. It's, they're, they're the folks, as they say it my way, brung me to the dance. That's how I get elected every single time. And everybody's shocked. I get overwhelming support from the black leadership, young and old. Brothers and sisters, you caught that, right? He said he receives support from the black leadership, young and old. Watch, within a, within a couple of seconds, watch what happens. Every poll shows me way ahead. And it's not just, I hear this, oh yeah, old blacks are with Biden, but young aren't. Look at the polling data. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if I picked that up right, but he sounded like he just contradicted himself, right? He said, old is with him, young is gone. So I don't know, maybe I picked that up wrong, but let me know if I did. Falling down, let's say it's off by half. Come on, man. Give me a little break here. This is where I come from. I got involved, I came home from college and I had a job with a really fancy law firm out of law school. And my city is the only city in America occupied by the National Guard the military for 10 months when Dr. King was shot. Oh, don't you just hate when these guys use the Martha Luther King bandwagon? And I had this fancy job, a kid coming from a, from a lower middle income household. I quit and became a public defender. And I stayed in that community. I was the only guy when I was in high school, I had a job, a country club, kind of job with a, at a swimming pool. I was the only white employee in East Side because I wanted to work in the projects because I wanted to understand. Whoa, 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 hold on. Understanding what, Joe? Understanding by sending over, what, a million black brothers to prison? That's how I got involved in politics. That's what this is all about for me. It's about equality. It's about dignity. It's about treating people with respect. And so, you know, when you take a look at my record, people talk about the crime bill. Crime bill didn't increase mass incarceration. Okay, Joe, but how does that explain the 99% of the black population inside of the industrial prison complex? Other things increase mass incarceration. And the reason why, if you go back and look, and I know you talk about it, you go back and take a look. That's why you had the vast majority of the Black Caucus at the time supporting the crime bill. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you starting to realize that Joe is starting to get a little hot under the collar. Almost every major city Black mayor supported the crime bill because Blacks were getting killed overwhelmingly as well. 
And what happened when that crime bill? It had four or five really important things. It had the Violence Against Women Act. It said drug courts don't send anybody who has a drug problem to jail, send them to rehabilitation, to a drug court. It had in it that had the uh, the assault weapons ban, getting rid of assault weapons, getting rid of the round, the number of rounds you could have in a gun. This is the time when I was hoping that Charlemagne was able to nail him, to put his back up against the wall. It also had in it a whole range of other things, but that things I didn't like. Clinton wanted to put in a deal where, in fact, three strikes and you're out. I opposed that three strikes and you're out bill. I opposed the position taken that saying that you're going to have any mandatory sentences. But on balance, the whole bill, what happened was it did, in fact, bring down violent crime in black communities as well. And guess what? The fact is, prison population didn't increase. 94% of every prisoner in jail is in a state prison, not a federal prison, no federal law. And here's the deal. The one thing I opposed in that bill was people wanting to give money to state prisons to build more prisons. I opposed it. But the point was, on balance, everything from the assault women's ban to the violence against women ban to the drug courts, they were important. And now look what we can do. Look, I've been pushing along with my colleagues in a black caucus in the United States Congress. We should change the entire, and I've been doing this for a while, change the entire prison system from one that is punishment to rehabilitation. There's only a couple things everybody has in common in jail. One is they were <clears throat> the victims of abuse of their kids were, or, their, or, their, or, their, or their mother was. Number two, can't read. Number three, they don't have any job skills. They were in a position where they didn't get a chance. Why does it make sense? Why did I come along and write the first act that said, when you get out of prison, you don't just get a notion where you get 25 bucks and a bus ticket. You end up under the bridge. You end up under the bridge and just do the same place. So every single solitary person being released from prison should have access to every single government program. Why does it not make sense to have African-Americans who are getting out of prison, <coughs> who serve their time, everybody for that matter, be able to have public housing? Why does it make sense that they can have Pell Grants to go to school? Why does it make sense they can have access to health care? What are we, nuts? I, I that's what we keep doing. Yeah, so I, sorry, that's, uh, that's our time there. Okay. It didn't seem like Joe wanted to wrap it up. But anyway... It's about to get very, very interesting at this point. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I know Jill has to use this, but I, I want I've talked too much. I apologize. No, let me. I got. I got to ask you though. You know why so much resistance on admitting the crime bill and, and other legislation you are a part of was damaging to the black community? Because we had Hillary on a few years ago, and Miss Miss Clinton said that the crime bill. Made, we made a lot of mistakes with that, and she wanted to atone for that by becoming the next president. Like She was wrong. What happened was, it wasn't the crime bill. It was the drug legislation. It was the, in the institution of mandatory minimums, which I oppose. Mandatory minimums. I oppose the I thought you create. I thought you uh, was a part of that in 84 as well, the Comprehensive Crime Control Act that established mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses. No, no. What happened was, you're, what you're confusing is, what, what happened was, the Black Caucus came to me and said, look, one of the, well, I did this study when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. We looked at every district of the, <coughs> of, the, of the 10 court districts in America, federal court districts, and we found out that if you got arrested for robbery and convicted, and I got arrested for robbery and convicted, it was the first time, you went to jail an average of 13 years, I went to jail an average of three years. So there was this whole move, same time for the same crime. So no one based on their color could go to jail longer than anybody else for the same crime. So what happened was there was a judicial selection committee setting up that how you deal with making sure that the sentencing process is taken out of the hands of a prosecutor saying, I'm going to want 12 years, 13 years for you, and three years for me. 
The end result of that was the unintended consequence, which we changed, Barack and I did, was the fact that you, in fact, all of a sudden, you could not lower my sentence or your sentence be uh, lower than what was the average sentence for everybody else going to jail in the districts. That's how that came about. It didn't say mandatory. We said to the judges, you can't send people to jail for the same crime different times. They have to be within a, 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 a framework. That's why that has been changed. And while I was vice president, I helped Barack, we reduced the prison population by 38,000 people. 38,000 people. And the only, the only mandatory was in there was carjacking, which I opposed, and three strikes and you're out, which is ridiculous. It only was imposed three times. But still, even once makes no sense. The idea of three ties, three strikes and you're out. Give me a break. And the other thing we have to do, one of the things that, you know, I was a public defender. I'm going to insist when I'm president that a public defender gets, a federal public defender gets paid the same amount of money as a federal prosecutor gets paid. So you have representation. People have representation. But the bottom line is, the other piece is, I'm going to try to change, and I've laid it out. I'll send you a copy of my plan so you have it. To see every it. voice? Pardon me? What, deliver every voice or what? No, the one Deliver that I, the plan I have is my manifesto for black America and, a, and particularly the portion of it that relates to how, in fact, we're going to deal with the prison system. If you are in prison, if you are convicted of a crime, no one should be going to jail for a drug crime, period. Nobody, nobody, so, no so matter what the crime, particularly marijuana, which makes no sense for people to go to jail. They should be just wiped out completely. And the reason is that, what, if anything, for those crimes that are actually continue to be crimes, scheduled crimes, as marijuana shouldn't be anymore, what is happening is you shouldn't go to prison. You should go to a, a mandatory rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It costs less to put people in a drug rehabilitation program than it does in jail. And you have a chance. We've got to give people a chance. Well, you know, Vice President Biden, I've read some of your black agenda and you say that you would decriminalize marijuana. What's the difference between legalizing it and decriminalizing it? Because they're trying to find out whether or not there is any impact on the use of marijuana, not in leading you to other drugs, but what it affects, does it affect long term development of the brain? And we should wait till the studies are done. I think science matters. I think we got decades. I think we got decades and decades of studies from actual weed smokers, though. Yeah, I do. I know a lot of weed smokers. <laughs> I want to ask you about your your, your running mate. Um, I don't know if you saw. Well, I saw the day that a news report broke that uh, Amy Klobuchar was being vetted, and a lot of people on social media they're not too happy about that. And um, it's because they want your running mate to be a black woman. I don't know if you saw the op-ed in the Washington Post by some of the leading black women voices in this country. And they feel since black women are such a loyal voting block and black people saved your political life in the primaries this year. They have things they want from you. And one of them is a black woman running mate. What, what do you say to them? What I say to them is. Brothers, is, brothers and sisters, even if Joe Biden picks a black woman as a running mate, up to this point, I really don't think it matters because right about now, Joe Biden has his back on the rope, and he's definitely running out of punches. Um, as you can see, Cory Booker, knockout. Kamala Harris, knockout. Peter Buttigieg, knockout. Elizabeth Warren, knockout. Bernie Sanders, knockout. What really matters is reparations. That's what really matters up until this point that I'm not acknowledging anybody who is being considered, but I guarantee you there are multiple black women being considered. Multiple. Well, you know, Thank you so much. That's really our time. I apologize. You can't do that to black media. You I can't do that to white media and black media because my wife has to go on at 6 o'clock. Okay. Oh, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions.
You got more okay. questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, and you ain't black. It don't have nothing to do with Trump. Brothers and sisters, last year, I had a show that was called Decision 2020. And this was a show that I was analyzing four out of the 21 candidates for the presidency. Now, out of the four, Joe Biden was one of the candidates that I analyzed. And I said to all of you guys that I don't trust Joe Biden. And this is the reason, this is the, actually the reason why I don't trust Joe Biden. And you really wanna know something, Joe? I'm a black man. But unfortunately, this black man is not going to vote for you. It has to do with the fact I want something for my community. I would love to see. Take a look at my record, man. I extended the voting racks 25 years. I have a record that is second to none. The NAACP has endorsed me every time I've run. The war, I mean, come on. Take a look at the record. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Anyway, thanks. I will come back. All right. I look forward to seeing you in person. Okay, absolutely. Okay, pal. Thanks a lot. I Thank appreciate you. it, Charlemagne. The crime bill was a cornerstone statue that accelerated mass incarceration. States and localities were incentivized through a massive infusion of federal funding to build more jails and prisons. And to pass so-called truth and sentencing laws and other punitive measures that increase the number and length of prison sentences while reducing the possibility of early release for those black men that are incarcerated. Brothers and sisters, all these policies were failures. The cost to society came not only from taxpayers' dollars that were invested in enforcement, but also from the disproportionate incarceration of a generation of black men in the name of public safety. Okay, brothers and sisters, this is the conclusion of my first time analysis. I, I think I did pretty good. I mean, um, at first I was a little bit nervous of doing this, but I think I did excellent. What do, what do you say? But anyway, um, please also don't forget to subscribe, like this video. It, it helps me a lot. It helps me with the content and I love what I'm doing, but I like to say that not only that I love what I'm doing, but I'm sharing information. Uh, I'm creating dialogue um, by doing this and creating interesting topics across the board. And that, that's helpful. That's helpful to me. That's helpful to our community. And right at this time, I think our community needs this. So, but anyway. Thank you very much. My name is Benoit Sherry. Peace out.